Hi there, my name is Jimmy Stice and I'm a real estate developer. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be standing on the stage talking to you guys today because I know there aren't many real estate developers who get asked to speak at TEDx events. Uh, we've somehow managed to succeed in raising our profession to being somewhere between lawyers and bankers in terms of the public opinion of us. Uh, but not without a lot of hard work. We've earned it, as I like to say. Uh, right now, a lot of my statistics will be from the U.S. because that's where uh, I've got access to a lot of them. Right now, the real estate industry produces 47% of all U.S. CO2 emissions. We consume 38% of all U.S. energy. So why am I up here talking to you? Uh, it's, I'm looking to change the way the world is built. And I'm trying to do so by starting by building the most sustainable small town in the world in a mountain valley about an hour from here where two small rivers come together against a 310,000 acre national park in one of the world's 25 biological hotspots. And so what am I going to talk to you about? Well, what I'm not going to do is talk about technology and architecture, kind of the two subjects of obsession when we talk about sustainable real estate when it gets talked about at all. Uh, that's because after obsessing over both of these myself, I've seen that they haven't really changed the industry very much. And I think that's because we're focusing on the tip of the iceberg. And as I got into looking at what it was going to take to build the world's most sustainable small town, I dipped my head below the surface and started reading books and talking to professionals. And I saw the iceberg got a lot bigger the further we went away from the public realm of what was being spoken about. And what I found there has, come to be, has become my seven pillars of good places. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And these are, you know, good places are walkable. They're food-centric. They integrate agriculture into the urban fabric. Uh, they're lifestyle-driven rather than by commodity building types. They're digitally connected now. They have to be. Uh, they support strong local economies. They create high levels of civic participation. And finally, they're financed sustainably, which is a crucial part of the entire, uh, for the entire formula to work. So let's go through these one by one. The first is good places are walkable. Now, we all implicitly know what this term means, but do we know how we achieve it? What makes a place walkable? There's actually five major components. First of all, walkable places have to be dense. Without density, we've got no place to walk to, obviously. Second of all, they've got smaller blocks, which create more frequent but smaller streets. This is because when you're walking along at two to three miles an hour, you want to be able to explore, to cut in and out of blocks and get places faster than when you're driving along at 45 miles an hour in your automobile. Third, they uh, have mixed use. So in the last half century, we did a really good job of pulling the historic city apart and moving residential over here, commercial over here, putting office over here and industrial over here. The whole idea was to undo the chaos and the inefficiencies of the old city. Unfortunately, all we ended up doing was moving the chaos and inefficiency to these places where we're driving between each of these all day to get anything done, as we're all pretty aware of, right? Especially in Panama City. Uh, the fourth thing is within this mixed use, so we've got to blend that back together and we've got to create, uh, we've got to blend it back together and have these mixed uses like we did in the old cities. The fourth thing is that we have, within mixed use, we have to have mixed products, particularly residential. That means instead of communities that are just single family houses, we have to have single family houses, townhomes, and apartments all blended together. And the final part of walkability is within these mixed products, we have to have mixed price points. So not just expensive homes, but also starter homes. Not just budget apartments, but also luxury apartments. And the reason for this is so that we can all live in the same place and become part of a community, rather than only live where our income affords us to live. So that I, as a 31-year-old, can live in a small apartment, and then as I get older and I want to you know, convince a girl to marry me and show her, show her that I'm financially responsible, I can buy that townhome. If we have kids and we make a little more money, we can move into that single family house. And then the same process can happen with my parents. As they get older, they want to retire. They can sell that single family house and move into a townhome or an apartment so that they don't have to deal with the cost of maintenance so that they can go out and travel and do the things retired people do. And so even though this sounds really nice, what does it mean in terms of our carbon footprint? You know, cities we think of as being resource consuming centers of the world. Well, the truth is in modern society, when we move from a rural area to a municipality, studies have shown it reduces our carbon footprint by anywhere from 10 to 50% depending on how bad the place we move from is to how good the place we're moving to. Uh, and in either end of the spectrum, we know these are significant amounts of environmental impact that we're, uh, that we're not having to create anymore. Uh, the other really nice thing, and you're going to see this as a theme throughout my whole talk, is that when we, move, when we live in a walkable place, when we're out on the sidewalk walking, we're more likely to bump into our neighbors. We're more likely to end up striking up a conversation with them. Okay, we're more likely to meet people we didn't know beforehand than the chances are of us meeting those people or having those conversations when we're going past them at 60 miles an hour in an automobile going from point A to point B. And it's important if you're going to build a sustainable place, that population has to be able to innovate the way it lives. And the only way we innovate is by having informal, casual conversations about our day-to-day -day lives. This brings me to my second pillar, which is we have to integrate food into our urban fabrics. 
Um, and when I say integrate food into our urban, fa urban fabrics, what I'm talking about is we need to bring the farm into the city. That's in terms of window boxes with herb gardens, in terms of small gardens in our backyards, community gardens where people can come out of their apartments and townhomes to be able to do some gardening, and actual commercial production of agriculture within urban fabrics, uh, both in greenhouses and open, open pasture. And this is in order to awaken food consciousness, to make us aware again of how our food is being produced, what's going into it that's affecting our health, and how that's impacting other people who are producing it for us and the environments where it's being produced. The reason we've got to do this is because when we all started moving off the farm in the developed world uh, a century ago, we, started, we believed that farms kept on functioning the same, that that milk carton with the cow and the beautiful pasture is how the farm actually is. But this couldn't be further from the truth anymore. You know, in a lot of places, it's now becoming illegal to take photographs of agriculture production facilities. And this is how different food is being produced today than it was when we moved off the farm. So the only way we can start holding uh, our farmers accountable and favoring the farmers who are using good production methods is if we actually know what goes into food production. And that's why we've got to bring the farm into the city. But what's this have to do, other than taking care of our own health and feeling good about the dollars we're spending and their effects on the planet, what's this have to do with um, our carbon footprint? Well, in the US, the average household's food consumption is two times uh, the carbon footprint of their uh, transportation. And the other really nice thing that happens here is we end up having, when we break bread together, we have a culture that revolves around food. Once again, we're having more conversations. We're interacting more. We know more about each other. We have more opportunities to innovate with each other. Brings me to pillar number three. These good places, they're lifestyle driven. And it used to be that in real estate, we were in a commodity business. We sold a certain product type, like single family homes, that is to a certain demographic. As I already said, we need to mix, we need to mix products, we need to mix price points. So this isn't good enough anymore. And what this does is it changes it to where we're no longer, from now on, if we're living in a place because of our lifestyle that we have access to, it means that we're living with people who share our values, not simply our same income. And what this means for us at uh, Kala Yala, in our village, is that the lifestyle we're selling is one of health and sustainability, which means that our residents and our consumers, when they show up, are already looking to purchase products which they ethically feel good about and which are good for their health. This means that the businesses in our community are more easily able to provide services and uh, goods that are already based in ethical production, lowering the uh, carbon footprint and the environmental impact of our consumption choices. And once again, when we live somewhere where we share things in common in terms of value, in terms of the lifestyle we're seeking, we're more likely to have things in common with our neighbors, and it lets us strike up these conversations more easily, create those collisions per capita. So the fourth pillar is that these places have to be digitally connected. Um, I know a lot of people think that social media is some annoying trend, but I've got to tell you, it's about as annoying as the telephone. And this is, in large, a good thing. It's not only helping us connect with each other more easily, it's also producing huge amounts of data. And for the most part, that data is being used to help us, to give us what we want in the most efficient way possible. Uh, and some really tangible examples exist of how we're able, how data is helping us live the same life, modern lifestyle while having less of an impact on the planet. Uh, for instance, in San Francisco right now, there's a company called Lyft. And Lyft, you can actually rent your neighbor's car when he or she isn't using it if they want to rent it to you. That means you don't necessarily have to own a car uh, to be able to get around anymore. And even more, on the more extreme, you have these sharing economies. One of my friends started a website called Yurtle.com. And at Yurtle, you actually put your inventory of things you're not using on the website, and people in your vicinity can find out what you're not using and borrow it. So if I want to go camping for the weekend, but I'm not a big camper, I can simply look for a tent that someone's offering me and use it for the weekend and then give it back to them. So once again, we're having the exact same modern lifestyle while not needing to use nearly as many resources in producing the goods to sustain it. And once again, when we're digitally connected, we end up having more of these collisions per capita, more conversations online and producing more data using them. The fifth pillar is that uh, these good places are, have support locally owned economies. Well, uh, locally owned economies are just what they sound like. It's where the businesses that provide the goods and services of our day-to-day -day lives are owned by the people who are physically present in our community instead of absentee invest, uh, owners. And this has a major impact. In fact, when you spend a dollar at a locally owned bookstore, it produces three times the economic impact in your community. That's three times the revenues, three times the jobs, three times the tax collections that help support the services of your community, compared to when you spend it at a bricks and mortar store owned by an absentee owner, such as Barnes & Noble. Now, why does this matter to us? Well, for us, we're creating a town in the mountains, a new town which means that we have to be very careful that we're not creating simply a resort community, or even worse, a commuter community where people stay overnight and drive into town every day, uh, choking out those roads and creating a larger carbon footprint. That means we've got to create jobs. When I'm giving two strategies and one of them has three times the result of the other, I'm going to pick that strategy, which is, which is why we have to focus on having a locally owned economy. 
Uh, the other nice impact of this, obviously, is when our neighbors own our businesses, we end up having more interesting conversations amongst each other, both about our neighbors and with our neighbors about their businesses. And it lets them innovate their businesses more easily to tailor them to us, their customers. So the sixth pillar is civic participation. Uh, civic participation is a good place to encourage civic participation, which has been on the, uh, it's been shown, all data shown in the US that civic participation has been on the steady decline since the late 1960s. And this is a big problem because it's civic participation is where we determine our collective destiny together. Okay? This is where all those collisions we've been talking about collide. This is where the conversation we had while we were walking, the one we had uh, while we were sharing, uh, sharing a t uh, dinner at the table, the one we had while we were out jogging or participating in some other lifestyle activity, the one we had online or about the data generated online, the one we had with the local bookstore owner. This is where all the ideas we had, all the talk, all the conversation we had are actually able to be turned into action. This is where we actually innovate our own community and control our destiny. And what's important about that to us is since we're trying to build the world's most sustainable town, it's an intentionally ambiguous and audacious statement that sets a goal which is unattainable, yet we, we, we can constantly pursue. And so for us to continue gaining efficiency in pursuing this goal, uh, we have to have civic participation so that we're all figuring out how to make that place as efficient as possible. And this brings me to my last pillar, which is that good places have to be sustainably financed. Um, you know, what does this mean? Money is just money. Well, that's not quite true. Finance is money with terms. And terms can make people do really strange things, sometimes even things that aren't in their own financial best interest. Uh, the big problem started when we started teaching discounted cash flows in business schools in the 1960s. Discounted cash flows are an incredibly useful analytical tool. Unfortunately, they have a habit of reducing investment windows to a very short period, often five years, to get in and get out of an investment. This can work great in a lot of industries and for a lot of products, but it doesn't suit each one very well. And it certainly doesn't suit community well since it's the definition of a long-term investment. And we're, stand we're standing here in Panama City, a city that was founded in 1519. Imagine if Panama City had been a five-year play to get the money and get out and go home. Imagine, now imagine if all cities had been founded this way. We wouldn't even have civilization today. Um, and so we have to have sustainable financing in order to allow us to be able to build places which are good for, for the people who live there and for the planet. Um, and what's beautiful about these seven pillars is that if we're able to practice them when we're, do it, when we're uh, developing real estate, it takes an industry which has started to look a lot like an extraction industry, preying on the, uh, using uh, egregious amounts of resources from the earth in order to, take, uh, to, to make a profit off of the people who live there and send that back to our investors. And it returns it to being a humane industry, providing one of those basic building blocks of civilization. All right, I'm Jimmy Stice. Thank you so much.